Welcome to day number five. And Peter, we have, we're going to just spend one week um, on the whole idea of sickness as we're exiting this COVID-19 pandemic. And um, obviously other parts of the world are still deeply embroiled in this, seeing some of their deadliest. But here in the US, we're here in Charlottesville, we're kind of moving up into the right as far as that goes. And then you approached me and said, look, let's do a week on sickness in the Bible. And, you know, with that, we're, we're people that believe in healing. Yesterday, we took a look at Jesus's um, healing ministry that was in companionship with his preaching, his teaching, <laughs> and the announcing of the kingdom of God having now invaded the world in him. And so what we wanted to do today was kind of look at those after Jesus who were still doing similar things. We see some healings. We were aware of healings in our own lives where people were prayed for and God touched them and brought healing. So as, in looking at this, kind of where do we want to begin? So we're, we're yeah. handing off the baton now. Well, let's kind of deal with the end of Jesus's life. Yeah, what is the death, burial, and resurrection yeah. with the context of sickness? Let's yeah. maybe deal with that. No, I mean, there's this sense in all the gospels that, um, what Jesus does in his life from a, from a certain point of view mm -hmm. is also what he does in his death and resurrection. Right, exactly. That the kingdom of God coming in his life um, is still coming in his cross and resurrection. Right. And throughout his life, he's had a couple um, relationships of conflict. Okay. Some of them with other people. Yep. Uh, people in uh, places of social, political, religious authority. Right, right, right. Some of them are with spiritual forces. Yep. And his cross is the moment where those, uh, which you might call temporal powers, earthly powers, mm -hmm. and those more spiritual powers, uh, they collaborate to come against to him. To kill him. Correct. And then, oh, big surprise, can't actually kill him. Right. And so, by the way, uh, it was a massive surprise, right? right? Even though he said well, it would be. Well, to some, but yeah. not to the people. This is the quandary I still haven't figured out, and City Church has had to hear me talk about this all the time. Right. The disciples don't expect him to come back. The Pharisees expect him to come back, kind of. They're like, well, they're at least worried yeah, about it. Like, yeah. oh, we got to make sure that if it happens. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the cross is this. By the way, if people are hearing a lot oh, of yeah. noise in the background, it's because we do live in a broken world and um, our, our building here is being worked on yeah. because even paint right. gets diseased. Things fall apart. Exactly. And so um, just because of the virtue of our schedule and their schedule, we just thought it would be a great added element yeah. to our devotion. Think of it as an illustration. There we go. Um, illustration. Yeah. No, so, so the cross is the moment where Jesus deals with all of this stuff. Right. In a, in a kind of fairly unique way. You right. know, he's prayed for people to be healed. Well, you know, a lot of people do that. And he's taught the truth about God, and a lot of people have done that. Well, in the Older Testament, there yeah. were healings, and people yeah. taught about God right. and all of that. And, and the apostles, mm -hmm. as, we're see, as we'll see, are also expected to do that. Or they do do that. Right. But um, it's the fact that in the final moment of his life, Jesus fights the fight against these forces right. with his own unique life. Correct. In such a way that God the Father then is able to resurrect him from the right. dead. And remember, his physical body right. is part of that right. fight. So yes. theologians sometimes talk about sin as a parasite that eats its own host. Oh, so, okay. uh, you know, if you, sin is like this little bug and it gets on us and it wears away at us. Well, the problem is uh, once it eats us up, it has nothing else to live on. Right. And Jesus is kind of, you think of it this way, the ultimate example of that. Mm -hmm. He's the person that goes, you know, you can send all the sin to me mm -hmm. and it'll get inside my body. Mm -hmm. And then my body will be crushed. Yes. And when that happens, the sin will also get crushed and defeated. Right. So then when I'm resurrected out from underneath it on the other side, right. we kind of leave all the sin and the brokenness, sure. we leave it in the grave. Yeah. And uh, that isn't, that's kind of how the cross fits in with the grammar of the rest of Jesus' ministry. There's a problem here though, I think, theologically, mm. Mm. which is when we hear Paul talk about how comprehensive and profound the defeat of 
the enemy is right. in Jesus' cross, right. it, can, it can lead us to have such rosy expectations for what life on the other side of Jesus' oh, resurrection means yeah, yeah. that oftentimes the apostles' lives, like we misread them almost. So here's right. one for me. Okay. Um, I, for a long time, kind of thought that, you know, if Jesus can take all the shame and guilt and all this stuff, mm -hmm. then our relationships should probably be perfect. Right. Or in a way they like need oh, to I, be perfect. Yeah, okay, okay. But Paul actually has moments of relational conflict. He does, yeah. Where you wonder. Even over the yeah. spreading of the gospel, he has conflicts. And you wonder yeah. if he's telling you the whole story all the way. So in his letters, he actually never really fleshes out what happens in Antioch and why he uh, had to leave. Yeah. And yeah. for one reason or another, maybe he's embarrassed. Maybe there's something he's trying to be mature and not say, I don't know. But or maybe the, he's just trying to keep it on the down right. low. And then later yeah. in his life, he will re-reconcile with these people. Correct. So, you know, Paul... At his request, right? they are. Yes. Paul does not have a relationally smooth and perfect life. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem like what he like lacks is faith in that way. Right. It, it just seems that, as biblical scholars tell us, Jesus' resurrection mm -hmm. creates a fold in the fabric of history. Okay. Where the future of God's having set everything right mm -hmm. kind of touches ground. It's supposed to happen the day after history is over. Well, at least all Jewish expectation right. is, is that it's at the end of all right. things, right? But now it's happened kind of in the middle. Yeah. And so we live in the in-between times mm -hmm. where it is just as expectable mm -hmm. that God would make something suddenly and miraculously sure. right as it is expectable right. that the reign of death would still continue to kind of claw at us yeah. even as it's been defeated. Yeah. And in huh. those moments, good. I think, to simply go like, well, it's really, really difficult to figure out what in those moments, if anything at all, mm -hmm. has gone wrong such that in this or that case, yes. we don't see the kingdom of God. And it's worth remembering, we're all gonna die, right? Like, yeah. from right, some, exactly. as much as God's yes. kingdom has been inaugurated in Jesus' resurrection, sure. the experience of our bodies right. is going to be the experience in and through yeah. death. And Paul deals with that. Paul's like, I know a lot of you think you're not going to die because the kingdom of God has come. I would just like to let you know. You are. You're going to die. Right. And it doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah. But don't get your hopes up. Sure. Now, in thinking the idea of sickness and the kingdom of God being ushered into this world through Jesus and then the apostles continuing the healings, you know, we obviously come up with the issue of healing in our day. Here's a classic example of something I just spoke with someone literally this morning. And what they talked about was here the pandemic hit and there's these vaccines that are available. And a big question was they didn't get the vaccine quickly because they felt, well, maybe it's a lack of faith. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not going to say right, wrong, whatever. But what it really prompted in my mind, because you brought the issue of sickness and the pandemic to me, what really came to my mind was at times, and I've seen this, where people say, if you go get medical treatment, it's a lack of faith, and you really just need to trust God. And I've seen that imposed on people. And what's fascinating, though, is that's actually contrary to Scripture. And what we find in scripture is, and Peter, I really wanted to make sure we covered this today, was that the Apostle Paul is mentoring his protege pastor by the name of Timothy. And First and Second Timothy are letters where Paul is mentoring him spiritually and pastorally. But we come up with this crazy verse in First Timothy chapter 5, and it's verse 23, where Paul writes this letter to Timothy, and he says this to him, in other words, Timothy, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Well, what we know is this wine was for a medicinal purpose. It, it, it was medicine. And Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, take your meds, like yeah. take your medication. Now, this is granted, there can be an over 
subscription of, or subscription of medications. A doctor could show up and just fill your, but it's not a lack of faith. Paul doesn't say to Timothy, hey, hey, Timothy, if you had enough faith and you were mature enough, you deal with your stomach issues spiritually and they, Timothy, get your faith going. What's wrong with you? And sad to say, I know of contexts where people have come alongside others and basically said, if you go get that medical treatment, it's a lack of faith. You need to trust right. God and the person's physical well-being absolutely tanked. Right. So when we look at this, we see there's a blending here of yes, believing for healing, but also understanding that God works through the medicinal realities of our world. And here Paul's saying to Timothy, Timothy, take some wine. Your stomach's upset a lot. We know uh, Timothy struggled with his nerves and with anxiety and all that we can tell clearly. So any kind of parting thoughts on that? Well, you know, Paul also has the experience of not finding relief in some kind of... And yeah, what that says, is. He yeah. says, I've got a thorn in my flesh, and the kind of standard theory is that he's going blind. Right, because uh, he mentions that, actually. Yeah, and his letters... You know. well, well, his letters, you know, he says things like... Um, I would have taken out my very... Or you yeah, would have taken out your very eyes. He's got some weird eye imagery, and then sometimes he also says, you know, like, I wrote this one, yeah. um, as opposed to a scribe or... Right. So, you know, Paul has that experience in his own life. Of well, whatever that, it is, let's well, just, yeah. Well, seeing something that he wants God to take away and God doesn't. Right. Um, you know, there's also the story that I come back to a lot um, in, in the Gospel of John where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Correct. And Incredible miracle. And Jesus knows it's going to happen. Yeah. And he, like, waits to go until Lazarus is dead. Correct. Because he knows it's gonna happen. Correct. And when he's at the tomb, he still cries. Sure. It's like Jesus doesn't think that in order to have faith, mm -hmm. you need to somehow produce the emotions that would be required sure. to fit the ultimate hoped outcome. Yeah. Jesus knows he will resurrect Lazarus. And he still weeps. And he still cries at his funeral. Yeah. And so um, I think sometimes we can mistake, um, we think faith needs somehow to be mustered or manufactured. <laughs> and this emotional yeah. frenzy of some sort. And so yeah. I, think, um, I think a big question, especially for uh, big faith traditions like ours, yeah. and a question we're only going to be able to raise and not going to answer is, right. how do you get more faith? Well, however you do it, you don't do it by faking it until you make it. Yeah. And it's very apparent to me with the text that we just read is that having mature faith does not mean that you avoid all medications. Right. It's simply, right. and so I just think it's interesting for us to kind of end on this note. I would also say this, that I believe that God's wisdom and God's blessing in the world has come through scientists who've been yeah. able to make medications that have saved people from river blindness and malaria and other things, right? And so when we look at the kind of the balance of scripture, yes, we're supposed to believe and trust for healing, which we do often. We lay hands on people, we pray over people. But on the other side, it's not a lack of faith to go and take medication that's going to actually help our physical well-being and keep death at bay. It's very clear yeah. that the scripture has that balance. Well, that's it for the, our time together. And so let's go ahead and pray. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you for your kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven stepping into the world through you. And thank you that as we put our faith, hope, and trust in you, we are now kingdom people where we truly are the people of your kingdom. Lord, avail to us those opportunities to pray for people who are sick and to see by your grace, your love and your mercy that people are healed and made whole. Lord, we also confess to you and we thank you for the medicines that are part of our world that you have blessed this world with. Help us now as your followers to see your kingdom come and your will be done here in Charlottesville as it is in heaven. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's video.